Okay, okay, hear me out. I think we did pretty good with this eBay special here. An HP pre-built, it's a ProDesk 400. Um, you certainly wouldn't want a game with this as is, but I only spent 50 bucks on it. Now, I believe this tower was mislabeled on eBay. This is the exact same seller we purchased two previous systems from that were also mislabeled as four parts or defective not working simply because they didn't have a Windows partition or a storage drive for that matter attached to the motherboards in question. And this screen here reveals that. Of course, there's nothing for this system to boot into because there's no storage drive attached. So it's not really defective or for parts. It's working, it just needs a drive. And that's a very quick fix, if you even wanna call it a fix. We were upfront with the seller about this mistake, this mislabeling. We told them we would send these systems back to them free of charge since they were quote unquote mislabeled, misdiagnosed, but they were super cool. They just said, hey, that's our loss, your gain. So that's really cool. But uh, I think we're gonna be able to turn this into something actually pretty sweet for the price. I'm aiming for around a $200 all-in budget. We're starting out with 50 bucks here on this thing, and uh, I think we lucked out. Depending on how much RAM is in here, I'm not sure because the, of course, description <laughs> was vague as usual, uh, we might just be able to swap out the power supply and throw in a pretty decent graphics card for around maybe 100 bucks or so and end up with a $200 bare bones gaming PC that will actually handle some newer titles in 720 and 1080p. I don't know, worth a shot. So without further ado, let's jump into it right after this. Stay with me. If you're sick of seeing that same Activate Windows watermark over and over, head on over to VIP SCD Key, where they have Windows 10 and 11 Pro OEM keys at a fraction of the price of retail. Just see the secure payment method like PayPal, enter your product key into your PC settings window, and say goodbye to the watermark. And be sure to use your offer code SKGS for that so sweet discount. First things first, let's see what we're dealing with inside. Uh, yeah, about what I expected. Actually, this looks like a standard MATX motherboard. It looks like we're going to be able to swap this board out in the future if we so desire. Maybe a sleeper build in the works. It has two uh, <laughs> two of its four DIMM slots completely removed from the board. I, I expect that's like a cost-saving measure. And uh, well, it's green PCB, cheap CPU cooler. I mean, it's what I'd expect in a pre-built of this caliber. Looks like this is a, uh, well, hold on a second. Let's flip things upside down. There we go, a 300 watt power supply. And thankfully it looks like we're using standard connectors. We have a 24 pin here off to the left and a standard four pin for CPU power. And check this out, we get a writable disk drive, something you don't see too much of anymore. Now something I'm heavily banking on is this sticker right here. I suspect there's a Core i5 in here, but I'm not entirely sure what generation i5 it is. This sticker suggests that it's at least a Skylake i5, which would be a pretty big win, maybe an i5 6400 or 6400T. That would be pretty sweet. I'm hoping it's not a Haswell i5, and I'm definitely hoping it's not an i3, because, uh, well, that sticker would be one big tease. First things first, I do want to clean it up just a bit. Ooh, this is some dark dust. Whew. All right, well, it looks better than it did, but it's... Certainly not deep cleaned. My real concern were the large chunks of dust that are no longer in here. Now let's go ahead and get this thing fired up with our portable monitor. Just gonna add a small discrete card here since we don't have dedicated HDMI out from the motherboard that tends to be an OEM trend. I'd be fairly shocked if this didn't power on based on our previous good experiences with the seller. We've got the power strip now on. We have a green light at the back of the power supply. That's a good sign. And here we go, power button. Uh, Hello? There we go. Yeah. The beeps are usually not a good thing. Um. Hmm. Three red beeps, two white beeps. I think we're gonna have to look this one up in the manual because uh, we're not seeing what the previous owner was seeing. At first I thought this had something to do with the discrete card we added. However, it looks like it has something to do with memory. We either need to reseat memory or swap dims. Maybe there's a dead dim or a dead memory channel. Maybe we knocked something loose while we were cleaning? I doubt it, but uh, man, these are, 
pretty stiff. We're gonna check these out anyway. Looks like we get eight gigs of DDR4 in this rig, which is pretty solid for a $50 system all in, although it is a bit odd that these are two separate sticks. So uh, one HP four gig stick, and it looks like another four gigs was added. This is a crucial dim here. Maybe one of these is bad. A few moments later. Aha, would you look at that? So we do get a post with the HP dim. Now we're gonna swap in the uh, crucial dim here and see if we can't get the same result. Maybe it doesn't like two different dims at two different frequencies. Well, I think they're both 2133 megahertz though. Ooh, actually this crucial dim here is slower. So these just might not like playing ball with each other. These OEMs can be very finicky as well. I bet we get a post with just this dim as well inserted. And would you look at that? No problems at all. I've actually tried at this point, both dims in both slots separately. So we don't have a dim specific issue. We don't have a slot issue or a memory channel issue. Uh, I just don't think these like playing ball all together. I'm going to give it one more shot swapping the two dims around from the original slots they were in because it is possible that the system is trying to default the frequency of the first dim which happens to be faster than the second dim uh, because of the slot order and sometimes the BIOSes can do that and it will create instability because the slower dim sometimes can't keep up at the higher frequency. That's why they're been the way they are and labeled the way they are and sold the way they are. So uh, let's swap things around. We'll give it one more shot. Worst case, not a big deal. I've got some very cheap DDR4 to throw in here. It's not gonna alter our budget by any major amount of money. 12 seconds later. Phew, well, it works now. I actually had to go back and check the footage to see which DIM was in which slot originally. Turns out we have things exactly the way they were before. I just didn't realize it. So it was likely just a seating issue, simply removing the DIMs and reseating them fixed it. it. I'm telling you, computers sometimes. So then, now that that's taken care of, we can now focus on overhauling this build. Starting first with the power supply, it is an absolute necessity to take care of that first so that we have enough power to supply to our discrete card, which I'll reveal shortly after. First, we'll need to remove this old unit and do the call. We have a clip back here to worry about. We're gonna push back on that. I should pop this out. I think I've got Ooh, yeah, there's a lovely dust bunny there waiting for us. This 550 watt EBGA BP power supply should do the trick. And while it is a tad shorter than the original unit, we shouldn't need to rely on the clip at all because more of the weight's gonna be situated near the back. She went in nice and easy. We've got it tightened down now and things have been rewired. Now I already see a few compromises we'll have to make if we wanna fit a larger card in here. This USB header for one is in a very crappy spot. This board is flipped upside down. So the, sh the shroud of the graphics card is gonna extend upward, which means it's going to hit this because our card's a little bigger. So we're going to have to disconnect this if we want to make it work. Uh, that's unfortunate, but not the end of the world. Same goes possibly for some of these SATA connections. I think these are actually high enough. They shouldn't be in the way. Speaking of graphics card time, this is an RX 5600 XT. And I stand by this. This is one of the best value graphics cards you can currently buy anywhere, new or used. I think for the performance that you're getting and the money you're spending, it just doesn't make any sense to buy anything else if you're content with 1080p or lower gaming. The 5600 XT is still a very capable card. You'll see that in the benchmarks we show a bit later. This isn't an extremely bulky card. It's not super power hungry or anything. And this particular SKU from ASUS, I think looks pretty darn good. I really can't believe cards like this are selling for $100 or less today. It will, however, be a slightly awkward fit since uh, we gotta kinda wiggle it in around this front frame here. Um, yeah, you know, I haven't entirely thought this through, if you can't already tell. See, the problem is this piece is riveted in multiple locations and it looks like it is a structural part of the case as well. A lot of boring math later. <laughs> I was about to switch cards entirely because I didn't think it would work. We actually managed to get it all in here. I just had to, uh, I had to finesse some things. I had to remove the uh, front panel assembly here to make a bit more room. The issue really was that there were just cables in the way where I had to kind of finesse the card. I had to get it past where it needed to go first and then rotate it because you can see the clearance between the edge of this card and this frame is, I mean, we're talking maybe a centimeter or so. So uh, very tight tolerances all around, but it almost looks like this card was made for this case because the cutout for the eight pin is right where it needs to be without us uh, having to press on anything alarming. Speaking of alarming, we need to be very careful with these extra cables. We don't want any of them to get snagged in these fans. That would uh, that would be a bad time. Also, these fans are kind of dirty. I thought I cleaned those. All right, I think we've got everything wired up now. Both fans spin without issue. We gotta be really careful about this. Uh, this is a speaker wire here and that thing keeps hanging down. Might have to zip tie that somewhere. 
But uh, all looks good, clearances look okay. I think we can put the front panel and the right side panel back on just to prove that it actually is a viable system and then we can power it on. I love how sleeperish this is. Just by looking at the exterior, you'd have no idea what we're packing on the inside. Here we go, power and also power. No beeps. Oh, we got one beep. Cable detection error, USB cable. Okay, it's. It's noticing that we disconnected USB 3. That's actually oddly specific. And would you look at that, loading straight into Windows. I didn't mention this, but I did connect our SSD from our other OEM videos as well. Um, this uh, is, which we've been using Intel platforms the whole time. I'm not expecting there to be a serious uh, driver issue, and I don't expect that'll affect performance either in the long run. But uh, if we were switching between Intel and AMD, well, often flip-flopping back and forth, you'll lose some performance because some old drivers remain that can conflict with new ones, and that's why I always recommend you reinstall Windows if you're switching between them, or if you're upgrading from a very old Intel platform to a very new one, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that note aside, we appear to be stable-ish. We're just sitting here on the desktop. Time to run some benchmarks. But first, before we get ahead of ourselves, what CPU we're dealing with, CPU-Z tells us it's a Core i5-6500. So yes, a Skylake CPU, no, not the worst Skylake i5 you could possibly have in here. Uh, I was thinking it would be a 6400 or even worse, a 6400T, which is like a, an underclocked version of the 6400. The 6500 is actually not bad. It is a slightly higher frequency chip, still only has four cores though, and only four threads. No hyper-threading here. As for our first First benchmark, you guys know the routine. This is 3D Mark Time Spy, a 1440p synthetic DX12. You can see the playback here is actually fairly smooth, anywhere between about 40 and 60 FPS. 1440p is, is kind of a, on the higher end for a 5600 XT, and uh, this card's actually seemingly holding its own here. But as for the physics test, this is gonna be CPU intensive. You can see things are running extra slow here, very low frame rate, not good for really any CPU, especially one with only only four threads. I have a feeling this is gonna catch up to us at some point in the gaming benchmarks. I will say though, a score averaging better than 28% of all submitted results is not too shabby for a $200 system. 3D Mark saying that a budget gaming PC in 2023 is somewhere around 10,000 on the score chart. We're averaging about 6,000 here, maybe a little above that. And uh, well, we're not terribly far off from this. Uh, it could be worse though. We could be an office laptop, so there's that. And if we compare specifically our graphics score to our CPU score, you can see that heavy implied bottleneck. The CPU is gonna be holding us back in a lot of these upcoming tests. So at first, as usual, GTA 5, a much older title, I think suits these sorts of builds much better in 2023. Unfortunately, in the 1440p high preset, we are um, <laughs> having a bit of trouble. Um, the frame rate's all over the place. You can see it's very stuttery, very jittery. In fact, there are some scenes where, I mean, we're holding on a single frame for about half a second or so. That is not good at all, not smooth. And you can see our CPU utilization across all four threads is often pegged at 100%. This is not desirable, and I'm actually kind of surprised that it's this bad. I have a feeling that many of the recent updates in this game have been taking their toll. It used to be four cores was plenty for this game back in 2013, 14, 15 when this came out, but uh, it doesn't look like it's enough today. And Skylake is definitely showing its age in the architecture department. Now, as things move down to the road, this is where, um, yeah, it just, it completely falls off a cliff. We've got scenes where cars appear to just be floating in midair, some scenes where the textures aren't being rendered fully, and other scenes where the textures aren't being rendered at all, we're just like driving on nothing. Because it is so bottlenecked on the throughput side for the CPU, it just can't process what's being generated by the graphics card quickly enough. This is why it's important to eliminate any bottleneck if possible. But here's where things get interesting. If we bump the resolution from 14 40p to 2160p, effectively 4K for gaming, this smooths things out massively. No more serious stuttering, no more crazy frame time spikes. It actually smooths out a lot and not at a huge cost of frame rate. We're still around 80, 90, 100 FPS or so on average in the flyby scene, which is pretty darn impressive. Now we're still heavily CPU bottlenecked, but the CPU is able to keep up a bit more as the frame rate drops since it doesn't have to make as many calls. Although I will add that totally goes out the window at the street view. Again, for whatever reason, this game just does not like playing well with this 6500. Moving on then to F1 23, just another title I wanted to throw into the mix here. This game actually 
fares quite well in 1440p high preset. We do have a bit of anti-aliasing and stuff mixed in as well, averaging somewhere around 70 to 75 FPS. Our CPU though, you'll notice, is not being fully bottlenecked. There is still a, a bit of a graphics bottleneck. I think it's because we still have the high preset running and, and a bit of anti-aliasing. But uh, overall, this is a much nicer, smoother experience because we don't have a serious bottleneck in either CPU or GPU category. And just for the lulls, I also decided to bump this game to 4K. I was curious, you know, $200 system, 4K should be the last thing on your mind, but actually not bad here. It is only about 30 to 40 FPS on average, but we don't see, again, any lag time spikes or anything. You notice our CP utilization actually drops overall, and that's a, a direct result, I think, of the frame rate dropping as well. So the CPU isn't working as hard to keep up with the frames being rendered by the graphics card. Totally normal. Um, the 5600 XT, though, isn't totally like breaking its back over this resolution. So if you're happy with 30 FPS in a racing game, and a lot of older console racing games around 30 FPS, then I suppose you could game in 4K with this. Not recommended, but just wanted to throw this out there. Now, to be clear, because I know some of you are wondering, how on earth is F123 playing as smoothly as it is and considering the price of this thing? And GTA 5, a much older title, significantly less intensive if you really want it to be, giving us these strange artifacting texture gaps and things that we haven't really seen in other quad-core chips that are not hyper-threaded that are even older than the i5-6500. And I think those concerns are warranted. It's almost like the CPU is not getting enough voltage or maybe the motherboard's base clock is screwed up. I did check in the BIOS. There's really not much we can do there. It's a very limited UI. Of course, we have a locked chipset and a locked CPU SKU, so we can't do anything there. But uh, there, were, there was nothing else that I could toggle that could really change the amount of power being fed to the CPU. So uh, I concluded that GTA 5 had to have been an anomaly. I went back and I tested a few other titles, Battlefront 2, Dirt 5, no issues there in 1080p or even 1440p, able to keep at least 60 FPS in those with around medium to high settings. So GTA 5, for whatever reason, it's just that strange outlier. Not often that that happens. In fact, I usually use GTA 5 for these older, cheaper rigs because it tends to perform quite well there. But I didn't want to give you the impression that this system is like hit or miss. I think for 200 bucks, you can't expect too much from it, but you're not going to have the kinds of experiences we had in GTA 5 and most of the titles you throw at it, as long as you've managed expectations. And I've got to say, bare bones builds like these have a special place in my heart. It wasn't too long ago, I was a young, broke college kid and uh, had only a few hundred dollars to my name. I had spent about $500 on a Core i3 GTX 750 Ti bare bones rig, or what I thought was bare bones at the time. Don't ask me why I paired a Z97 motherboard with that uh, CPU, it, it really made no sense. But I really wish back then, I had somebody like myself on YouTube telling me to instead spend $200 or something in that ballpark on this or something like this, it just would have made so much more sense. I was a baller on a budget, or at least I thought I was, and I thought I was building something really good. In reality though, I probably could have built something much better if I had just entertained the used market. If I had just entertained OEMs like this, I know they don't look appealing. Yes, this case sucks. Yes, the stock power supply sucks. Yes, the CPU cooler sucks, but it doesn't mean you have to completely sacrifice in the way of performance, right? We were testing in 1440p intentionally here to show that this will actually punch well above its weight class in the price department. Heck, scoring around 30% better than all submitted results in 3 d Mark Time Spy, a 1440p synthetic, is really good actually for a $200 rig. And that's all I wanted to prove here. You don't need to spend $500 or $1,000 to get a decent entry-level gaming PC. $200 will do it if you'll just take the chance on some used hardware and maybe even an OEM. Yeah, it can look a bit cringy at times. I have absolutely no idea how I'm gonna get this graphics card back out of here. I think I'm gonna have to just leave it permanently <laughs> installed. But uh, like, those are the, the side effects of tight budgets. You know, I, I tend to look at things with a fairly neutral perspective at first, and then if I am genuinely shocked and impressed by how things turn out, then there we go. I mean, that, that's all the more upside. I don't go into much of this optimistically. I really don't. As long as you account for the dimensions, like proper fitments, you can usually finesse the rest. Um, I really wasn't looking forward to taking a Dremel to this or like a drill bit and like, you know, you know drilling out the, the rivets and things, but uh, we didn't have to, right? So. That was, a, that was a win, at the very least in my book. We didn't have any other major issues apart from that slight RAM problem in the beginning, but um, actually turned out okay. For 200 bucks, I, I, I really can't complain. I don't think you should either. Unless you can find free hardware, it's gonna be pretty tough to beat something like this 
in today's market. I know that you know discretionary spending's going down, enthusiasm in this space is going down, but it doesn't mean you have to just completely cease working with hardware at all. You can just scale back your budgets a bit. If you wanna build something like this for a friend or a family member, I mean, 200 bucks is a lot more approachable than five or $600. Yes, it's used. Yes, it comes with its own set of risks. Yes, buying on eBay can take longer. Sometimes those parts aren't going to work out of the box and you have to go through the refund process. Yes, it might be a headache. I think that's actually part of the fun though. When it all works out in the end, it just feels much more, I don't know, it feels like you accomplished something extra. And that's one of the things that you don't get with a new build. You expect things in a new build to work at the first time, especially if you've been building PCs for a while. So you never really know what you're gonna get with these. So if you wanna spend 40, 50 bucks by yourself an OEM and try your luck, I think it's the best 40, 50 bucks you could spend as a tech enthusiast, I really do. Apart from maybe buying like complete mystery tech or something, but I'll leave that to Austin Evans. If you guys enjoyed this one, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing if you haven't already. Leave a comment down below and check out the description for relevant links. My name is Greg, thanks for learning with me.